Hi, some faces know me. Um, I've been working at North Shore Hospital off and on for about uh, seven to ten years, so um, both in a clinical nurse specialist role and a staff nurse role. Um, but I have experience in hematology in Brisbane and London, um, so quite diverse. Um, I've worked about half of my career in the transplant setting. Um, we don't currently do them at North Shore Hospital, which uh, some of you will know. Um, and it is something that I think we need to be exploring, um, which is why I chose this topic as um, a presentation that I did for the Myeloma Summit in August uh, down in Queenstown. Uh, there are many centres around the world that are doing um, outpatient autologous transplants. So auto-transplants is the other phrase that you might have heard. Um, and I'm going to discuss with you the need for autologous transplants in New Zealand, so stem cell transplants, but um, also how they could possibly be done safely as an outpatient service in the future. Um, yeah. Does that make it clear, that phrasing? Yeah, mm. so s s the reason why we say stem cell transplants are those are the cells that we harvest. So an autologous just means patient's own. Um, often we refer to them as autos uh, alone. So um, if everyone's comfortable with that phrasing, I can use the word autos. So um, as I said, what would outpatient autologous stem cell transplant as a service look like in New Zealand? So I want to break it down first into the need. Um, so do we have a need for autologous stem cell transplants or autos? Yes, we do, as some of you will already know. Um, and what are the disadvantages and benefits of doing it under this model? What is the impact on the patient and their whanau? And what would the health system need to do to be able to get into that position to provide that service? So the need. Um, we know at the moment that Te Whatu Ora nationally is under a lot of pr pressure. Um, we have issues with limited resource including staffing levels which means that we are also struggling to provide some services that are essential. What we hope or what I would hope by moving this service to an outpatient service is that we would be able to reduce workloads for inpatient areas where maybe more acutely ill patients like say an acute leukaemia who needs uh, a more intensive chemotherapy and also maybe an allogeneic transplant where room could be made for those patients in the inpatient setting, while still providing safe and effective auto transplants. Um, also, um, we would want to improve the patient experience um, and reduce costs to NZ Health to Whatura. What does improve patient experience mean? Uh, I'll come to that, but uh, basically what you would do at home or the benefits that you would get from being at home from a mental health perspective that being in a hospital you can't. Um, you mentioned the word allogeneic, what does that mean? Good question. So that means cells from someone else, so a donor that donates donor, to a patient. Cells. Yeah. Right. Yep. So I'm going to go back a step and talk briefly about what an auto transplant is just in case there are people who haven't been through one yet, are just at the start of their journey, um, or support people who don't know either. So an autologous stem cell transplant is a major therapeutic option for patients with multiple myeloma who are eligible, eligible for transplantation, and I'll talk about what eligible means later, and have achieved at least a partial response after combination chemotherapy. And the main objectives of this mode of treatment are to eliminate any residual mutated plasma cells <coughs> and to produce a deeper response from the treatment which will hopefully improve prognosis overall and a better progression free survival in the long run as well as overall survival rate. So there's lots of studies overseas um, around uh, these style of transplants because they're not <coughs> a small thing, they can be quite involved and can be quite um, a, a process for the patients. So it is not something that we do lightly, but we do know from research that it is still currently one of the best options for myeloma patients and myeloma patients in New Zealand. Um, 
these lower intensity transplants from an outpatient setting have an advantage from a cost point of view, but are um, not always clinically appropriate for every myeloma patient. And again, I'll talk a little bit about what that means later when I talk about um, patients who are eligible. The need to reduce cost and workload for our hospitals is already apparent across New Zealand, and I'm sure, unfortunately, you have people that you know or you have first-hand experience of the shortcomings of the hospital services that we currently have at the moment in New Zealand. Is the chemotherapy that we get during the stem cell as an intensity period, is that going to be based upon what we're currently doing or is that a more intensified and harder on you? It's more intense and harder, yeah. And if we look at this slide, what happens is we administer pre-treatment to release stem cells after you've gone through your induction, induction phase of chemo, can, which is what you're on at the moment. So it generally involves things like cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone and Valcade. Um, and then we will go on and collect the stem cells from the bloodstream and we do that by promoting the stem cells to spill over from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. Then they get frozen in the lab once they've been processed, so they'll check them for things. They check that there's a good number of the stem cells. Um, and then we administer chemotherapy to the patient to remove or reduce the myeloma down to as bare minimum as we possibly can without causing huge toxicities to the patient. And then we return the thawed blood stem cells by infusion into the vein. Um, and that's all done in a transplant centre generally at the moment, in Auckland at least, um, as an inpatient. And then we provide supportive medical treatments for at least four weeks as the immune system rebuilds. Mm -hmm. what, what's involved in that? Is that like quarantining sort of? So here in Auckland and historically, yes, it is, you're isolated to a room. Um, in our haematology unit, say at Auckland Hospital, for example, in Auckland, um, where they will support you with blood products and antibiotics and monitor you closely, um, help keep your appetite up or at least keep your nutrition levels up um, and then wait for the bone marrow to repopulate with the um, more pure stem cell uh, infusion that you've had um, and then discharge you when it's safe to do so. So that's estimated about four weeks. Yep. So it could be a little bit shorter, a bit longer. Yep, sure. how you're doing yep. Yeah. Yep. Why do they have a negative room? Uh, negative pressure room? Yeah. So when you have someone whose immune system is really low, the idea is that you want to push the air that's in their room out to the edges of the room so that it's only their own sort of air that they're breathing off in the room. And when a person comes in and opens the door, it lets in as little from the outside as possible. The opposite is what we call a HEPA filtered room, where if a patient has TB in their lungs and they're breathing it off, you want to suck all that up and out of the room so that when someone else comes into the room, they're not exposed to it. So when they're at home, that's all provided for? So because mm -hmm. in your own environment, you're not going to have generally the exposure to all the other things that a hospital might expose you to, you don't need them. But there's still the staff that come into the room? Not when you're at home. So and I'll talk to you about that as we go through the step-by-step -step process of what it means. Coming into the outpatient department, you might be, but we would be encouraging you to wear masks and so that would also protect you. The other thing that happens is the rooms that control the air and push them out to the door are really good for patients who are going to have a prolonged period of four weeks and they're the allogeneic transplant patients that I was talking about because we have to knock back their bone marrow so much more than we do for a patient having an auto. So their immune compromise period is longer than the four weeks and they are generally get lots or have greater risk for infection so they're the ones that would need to be in those rooms more so than an auto patient and the negative air is because the carrying any sort of virus or germs in the air is it yeah keeping sort of room. pure yep okay yep 
the good thing with wearing masks like we do nowadays, actually, we protect ourselves quite well anyway. Yeah. So if you were just going for the auto one and you're coming up to do your first stem cell, is that likely to be done in the hospital for four weeks? So, or yes. why are we talking about the outpatient, which is doing it at home? Yeah. That, so, so which, how, which way is that? This what does is, that mean for me? This is something that I think will happen in the next maybe 12 months, two years. Can, mm. It's probably not going to happen mm. in the time frame that you would have right. the... And I'll talk a little bit about why that is um, later. So what do we look for with stem cells when we give you the little injection into your tummy that helps to promote the production of the stem cells so that they spill over from the bone marrow into your bloodstream? That's what they look like. And they have a CD34 marker on the outside that the um, scientists look for when they take the sample uh, to check that there's enough of them in the donated cells. And where do they sit? They sit here. And a stem cell is magic because it can become any of these cells depending on what the body needs. And what we do is we catch it at this point so that we're able to purify it down in the lab and then re-administer it to you once we've got rid of stem cells, normal blood cells and any myeloma um, or as much myeloma as we can in your bone marrow and then return these stem cells that are in a better condition in the hope that you have as long without myeloma as possible and they can then continue to generate all of these cells that your body needs. The healthy ones, or yes. balance. Yep, the healthy ones, yep. So these are what we look for when we're waiting for your stem cell, uh, for your bone marrow to repopulate with the donated stem cells, red blood cells, platelets. These will come up and these are all the different immune system cells um, those produce some nerve cells, I believe, and then those are the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, which are also immune system cells. Has it ever not worked like that? Uh, as a, as in the, the, either the cancer cells, do you just chuck along, or that we don't quite get everything back where, where it's supposed to be? So, with autos, I don't think I've ever seen someone that hasn't engrafted and engrafted means the stem cells make their way to the bone marrow and repopulate. Um, does, can the myeloma break through the treatment? It's not common at all but there are some rare aggressive myelomas that it may, you may not get much of a remission or no myeloma period before they do start coming back. It's individual, is it? It is. Your doctor would be able to tell you if you had a good myeloma that will respond to treatment, and you often, before the transplant, you would have an idea anyway. The doctor will also have told you if you have an aggressive myeloma, because it's part of how they have to educate you about what's going on in your body. So you would generally know before the transplant if you had an aggressive form of myeloma or not. Sometimes you can get plasma cell leukemias, which are kind of like, they behave like a bit like a myeloma, and they are ones that may not have much of a um, period without disease before it relapses. Mm -hmm. This is another reason why we keep the autos as symptom free or as side effect free as possible, because we want to be gentle but still knock the myeloma as much as we can. So they can be like rogues, I suppose, aren't they? Some of those cells are rogues. Um. Yeah, yep. So this is what harvesting stem cells looks like. Um, you're connected to a machine where it will be drawing blood off from veins on one arm and returning the blood on the other. It processes it through the apheresis machine and it's looking for the stem cells and it bases them on colour. Um, there are a few side effects that the staff will be looking out for because things like the anticoagulant that they add to the blood so that it doesn't clot in the machine can lower your calcium levels and your magnesium levels in the blood. So um, they will be doing that. So, that's okay. Are there any questions about that? I think some of you have probably been through this part already, haven't you?
it means sometimes sitting for three or four hours at a time, which can be. So um, with the home process, that would be done in the hospital, and then you'd go home. Um, if you were having an outpatient one, yep, yeah. you get harvested. The the stem cells get harvested at NZ Blood. Mm. Um, sometimes they'll have a mobile unit, and the nurses at uh, Auckland will be part of the process, but generally it's done at NZ Blood as part of the oh. service. What causes the smell of like uh, the sweet corn? Yeah, that's the preservative. Oh, okay. yeah, uh, it's quite distinctive, isn't it? It's quite strong, yeah. Yeah, it lasts in the room because all the windows are shut and the doors are shut for <laughs> quite a while. So, um, talking about the need in New Zealand, some hospitals have haematology departments in New Zealand that do outpatient um, autos already. Mm -hmm. So, Palmerston North, Wellington, Christchurch have some done done some in the past, I believe, um, and also possibly Tauranga. Um, it is also, as I've said, commonly done in large hospitals in America, Canada, Europe, the UK and Australia. Why is it not done in Auckland? <laughs> so this is a bit of a conundrum at the minute. Um, these are numbers that I got our innovation centre at the hospital to pull off from Te Whatu Auto's database. Patients having procedures get coded, so the procedure will get a code, not the patient. And these are the codes here for anyone having an auto uh, stem cell transplant. And these are the numbers for each hospital at each year from when the data was collected. So as you can see, it's not the total across the top hasn't been a massive jump. We've sort of gone from 184 to 205. And Auckland City Hospital has probably had the biggest jump in that time frame. But Palmerston North does 20, Christchurch does 43. Um, you've got Waikato is it, doing is that 39. Per year? Yeah, so this is, this is year to date, 2021 to 2022. Okay, and all the <coughs> hospitals had a big increase in the number of Since we started collecting the data in 2013, yeah. It's still not a huge jump when you think about all those numbers of years, yeah. um, but we're pretty confident that this data is accurate. Obviously not all data is, um, is going to be 100% accurate, but we're pretty confident that it's, it's up there, percentage-wise. So you can see there's a broad spread of units doing things. Some of the, like Dunedin, um, they send this to Christchurch at the moment, and that's a staffing issue, I think, or a resource issue. Um, yeah, Wellington do 16. And that's sort of bobbled along and in fact gone down. Are there any other questions about that? No, it seems apparent that Auckland does more. Yeah, they do. Well, they cover counties as well as yeah. North Shore and Northland. Yeah. Mm. And that's because some have been done out, outpatient, is it? No. Not no. Though. So I Auckland did. doesn't currently do outpatient. But the other ones? Wellington do them. Would, is it reflected in showing? No. So interestingly, I queried this with some of the doctors and also the Cancer Control Agency, which is a organisation that has been created to help improve cancer statistics and outcomes um, in New Zealand. Um, and we don't currently have a database specifically for collecting outpatient auto um, numbers, which is something that we might work on hopefully as this service improves and develops and um, is something that starts up in Auckland. So how long have they been doing the outpatient ones in New Zealand? It's a really good question. I'm not sure. I have a feeling Wellington has probably been doing them the longest, but um, that's not something I would uh, leave mm. my house on. Um, and I would have thought maybe over the last five to eight years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's still new. Yeah. Not, so I was yeah. doing, I helped with a pilot program set up at University College London Hospital in London 20 years ago, mm -hmm. where we set up the first outpatient auto transplant then. Um, and it seems 
a shame that we're not mm. doing that here, which is part of why I've chosen this topic to talk about because I think it's uh, <coughs> something that we could definitely work on. Yeah. Would it be a lot safer to do it in that quarantined hospital environment than trying to do it at home with all the randoms that are happening there? It depends on your home life. Definitely depends on home circumstances, and all of that needs to be taken into consideration when you're looking at whether a patient is eligible or not for this service. Yeah. Do any other like private hospitals offer the same service? I don't believe any mm. private hospitals in New Zealand do transplants. They're too complex. Yeah. You may in Australia, and you probably definitely in America. Yeah. So this is from a reduction of cost point of view, um, because of course I was presenting to doctors and nurses and these things are interesting to them amongst the other interesting points. From an overseas um, collation of studies, they worked out that there could be quite marked um, improvement in spending or reduction. So um, that was the uh, one that had the least improvement um, and this one found that they saved 43%. Obviously, there's a couple of things to bear in mind because these are international studies. What were the quality of the houses that the patients were living in? How much access did they have to some of the medications that we don't have here? So it's not completely comparable to our environment um, and we wouldn't know until we started collecting data on these patients having these outpatient autos. Um, but it is interesting to think that there is something in there that we might be able to do um, to help and also improve patient experience without jeopardising the goal of getting the myeloma into remission for a while. So what are the risks and advantages? Who qualifies for an auto transplant full stop? You need to be under the age of 70 in most cases um, for some some centres that's even less, so 65 is their cut off, um, and in some centres they will um, take it on the individual over 70 as to how well they are functioning, they're independent, they have no other issues with their health, heart, lung, those sorts of things. If they're really fit, um, then they may be considered for one. Um, normal or near normal kidney function, normal or no, near normal liver function, um, lung and heart that have been tested and meet a certain threshold um, with all other organs considered. Um, have near normal bone marrow function because of course while you're on chemo near normal is pretty good. Uh, and the myeloma is responding to the chemotherapy that was started at diagnosis. Sometimes we have to tweak what people are on um, due to side effects. So you might find that cyclophosphamide gets swapped out for thalidomide um, but generally that would still be considered the baseline treatment that you're on. So what about having it as an outpatient? So this is refers to the inpatient setting. What do you think criteria might need to be? And we've sort of alluded to some of it already. So the studies that I looked at overseas looked at housing, <coughs> looked at how far away the patient was from the centre, because that's important if you become ill at home what supports were around that patient, um, how compliant they were because of course compliance when you're the one and your carer are monitoring yourself recovering from something quite um, intense then you need to be pretty good with taking the medications and taking your temperature and doing those things to help keep you safe. So all of these go into the melting pot or the, the consideration pot for patients having these services. Well, there's going to have to be a carer, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. And I'll show you what some of the international, um, one of them, what their criteria were specifically. So what are the side effects of a transplant? We know nausea and vomiting can be an issue. We know patients can get mouth ulcers because the cells in the mouth divide quickly and, be, and are knocked around by the chemo because they absorb it quickly. We know you can get low platelets, red blood cells and immune system cells. There can be diarrhea. You can get some cardiac abnormalities um, like palpitations, fatigue and low mood and of course infection. Some patients can have bleeds, nosebleeds, all sorts of things. 
and you may need transfusions. Well, I sucked on ice, I think, and it prevented the mouth ulcers, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, while you had the mouth in. Mm -hmm. mm. It's quite good. So, bear with me, the, the next... Is there a question? Mm. No? Ah, the oh, next. I did have a question. It's about yep. infection. Yep. That, I mean, what's the bigger risks? Is it just going to be something like the common cold, flu sort of thing like that? Or is, is COVID going to be a, a big factor here that I to consider? Or, or is it going to be just like when you suck in sores or something, you know, that sort of physical infection. Yeah. I don't know what the most common infection is. I would have thought currently it would be respiratory of some sort, whether it's COVID or whether it's flu that's going around or, or the cold. I would have thought those would be the most common. Then you've got things like diarrhea um, because our bodies actually harbour some bacteria and viruses that we mm. as professionals can't detect but when your immune system gets low they can flourish um, and those can be things that we can give you antibiotics for and, and get on top of it but we just may not know what they're going to be before your immune system has that dive. Yeah. Um, that actually but, sounds quite worrying what you know like, yeah, the guts you take it for granted but that's obviously a big area to cover is it but that's you do think that you're okay safe wise from a antibiotics point of view but it's the if, if you're going to die it's the respiratory and it's what's going to knock you off is it um i, I wouldn't say knock you off it's just that you get sick with it for a period of time okay. yeah. yeah yeah um so this these are quite um statistics driven and i'll i'll try and break it down um please uh, if you've got any questions just let me know but um this study looked retrospectively at 500 outpatient autos in the states in a transplant centre and it was for my myeloma between 2015-2019 and 31.6%, so 158 patients who were having it as an outpatient needed admission during their treatment course. So, And they considered that for this within 20 days of the transplant. So you have day one, which is or day zero, which is the infusion of the cells again, uh, and it was day 20 post that. The main reasons were neutropenic fever, so 82% of patients, so infection. Um, there was also nausea and diarrhea that they needed to get under control, um, and also poor oral intake, so patients needing intravenous hydration, and that was in around 54% of patients. Um, the remaining 40% that were admitted had the arrhythmia, arrhythmias that I was talking about and or a cardiovascular event, um, pain and risk of bleeding or bleeding. What was that overall percentage? Mm -hmm. then? 58. Um, really need your so out third, of the 500. Yeah. Like third, it, it's so mm -hmm. yeah. 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 The and that's and actually the, um, the doctors when I was explaining all of this said that they think that's quite light. They think generally that more patients need um, in New Zealand would probably need some input of some sort. Whether it was admitted for uh, antibiotics and then sent home because overnight the fever settled and they were went home on oral antibiotics. Obviously retractable nausea, diarrhea and poor oral intake we can get under control generally quite quickly too um, with hydration and anti-nausea medications either oral or intravenous. I was having high temperatures after my um, autologous at Auckland yeah. so I was going in to North Shore a bit and having antibiotics administered and then you know that made the difference of course. Yeah. Um, and generally, we're able to get on top of these things um, quite well. The median inpatient stay for the patients who were admitted, so these 158, was about 7.7 .7 days. And the conditioning treatments that they got, so this is the um, intensive chemotherapy, was either melphalan or VTD PACE with low dose melphalan. So this isn't something that we generally use. We predominantly use melphalan, um, at least in Auckland, is my understanding. The median oh, age was 61, and all patients had a functional score and organ function um, review. So functional score means you're able to get up and get yourself to the toilet and back. You're able to feed yourself, maybe prepare meals or do some light um, chores around the house. You may or may not be working, um, and you are um, compass mentis, so you have all your faculties from a mental perspective, or most of them. 
Um, yeah, were there any questions about that one? No. So this was uh, one from Vancouver General Hospital in Canada, and they looked at um, patients between January 2007 and June 2016. Um, and they had um, some patients who'd had two transplants, but I'm just gonna talk about the 752 that had outpatient um, autos. Their admission rate from this outpatient cohort was similar at 32.6%. Um, and they looked at it for within the first 30 days from day zero of transplant. And the medium time to admission was nine days post-transplant. So we all know from having chemo that the chemo has its effect on our body and the, st the cells drop off the normal cells and the disease cells and then they regenerate. And that takes about seven to 10 days. So this is not surprising that day nine was the, the average. Um, the median duration of admission was six days. So similar to the other study, um, and this talks about mortality rate and transplant related mortality, which are really low, as you can see, 0.9%, 0.4. So even though there were people needing more intensive support, um, it didn't translate into anything. It was that 0.9%, so it's always 0.1%, 0.1, 1,000. And that, that's of the people that took the... Outpatient also. Not, not the ones that had complications, it's one in a thousand. It's the, the whole top. cohort, yeah. 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 Uh, this one looked at, um, it did a systematic review of all studies and found that inpatient stem cell transplant versus outpatient um, for experience of it ended up being equal or better across numerous studies and it covered illness associated with the transplant, so side effects like febrile neutropenia, so infection, right through to patient satisfaction, which is important. And this is what, um, unfortunately, not enough studies in my mind focused on. Um, and it is something that if we looked at it and collected data from New Zealand, that we would be wanting to know what this meant, breaking it down, and not only patient satisfaction, but also care satisfaction and wellbeing as well. Um, from the same review, the cost of the transplant was also reduced, as, we've, um, as would be logical. The only thing that um, I wonder in New Zealand is whether the cost of the drugs might um, mean that we don't make as much of a cost savings as we might have done in other countries. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's found to be equal or better across numerous studies. The two. Okay. So breaking them down, the advantages of doing an outpatient transplant would be to improve patient satisfaction and quality of life, decrease cost of care for the institution, and also increase program capacity by freeing up inpatient beds. The disadvantages is that it requires significant infrastructure, which, mean, which means staffing and resource. We would need to have centres open seven days a week, so our outpatient centres. Um, we would need to have access to the, an inpatient bed where if a patient was not well enough to be at home anymore, they could go straight up into our um, inpatient areas without there being too many delays. Um, it also requires full-time caregiver availability, as you mentioned, Hine, and shifts significant burden of care to the caregiver. Shifts some cost to the patient and caregiver too. So these are the things that I think we would need to be thinking about from a, an LBC perspective, from a patient and perspective. Um, and creating the service, there would need to be an interaction between the two groups, so the institution and the um, patient group, so that we're able to support and create something that's holistic and helpful. That's a wise, a, a wise decision is made, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, because I can only assume so much about what it's like for you guys. You guys mm. actually go through it. Oh, what I was going to say, I don't know if it'll go. Maybe we need to start looking at employing this lovely, enthusiastic lass here to help with the stuff. I'm sure it is. She's a lovely photo. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll be an old photo, won't it? Yeah, it looks like one. Yeah. So what's next? 
how do we make this happen? Can we make this happen? Obviously, I've identified some issues, and I've also said that it's going to be a long way off. Well, what feels like a long way off. Um, at the moment, Auckland and the other transplant centres have something called fact accredita accreditation. That's so that we are managing the process of um, diagnosis of the patients, harvesting of the stem cells, keeping of the stem cells or storing of the stem cells and then administration of the stem cells up to a standard that's internationally recognised. Um, it covers, as I've said, the entire spectrum of stem cell therapy from clinical care to donor management, cell collection, processing storage, transportation as well, administration and cell release. Um, this process of FACT was founded in 1996 um, and it established standards for high quality medical and laboratory um, practice and cellular therapies. It's non-profit, the organisation that um, awards FACT accreditation um, and it is used internationally um, and in fact it's the only international standard used in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the US. There is another one um, that people refer to in Europe a bit, uh, but this is the only one that's used globally. So what must a centre do to get fact accreditation? Because of course we want to be making sure we're providing the best possible service. They must be performing autologous and or allogeneic transplants on adults and or paediatric patients as appropriate for type of accreditation sought. So, for example, if North Shore were to start doing autos and we needed to get fact accreditation, we would need to do it just for autos. We don't do peds. Um, the, my department doesn't do paediatrics. They go to Auckland still. Um, but then that's probably not something we would seek to do. You must use products collected and processed in facilities that meet fact. JC is the other standard that we sometimes see used in Europe standards. And we know that NZ Blood they come under Auckland's umbrella for a fact accreditation, but they meet all of the rigorous um, standards and they are audited every year, I believe. For a clinical program requesting accreditation for only auto transplantation, a minimum of five new recipients of auto transplants must have been transplanted at the site during the 12 month period immediately before the accreditation and at a minimum on, on uh, on average five annually within the accreditation cycle. So if we were to look at the numbers that Auckland did, if North Shore were to take their patients away from Auckland and Middlemore take their patients away from Auckland, we'd be looking at about maybe 20 um, at North Shore a year, for example, which means that we would be doing, we could be doing five uh, easily if they were qualified those five. A dedicated transplant team including a program director and at least one other physician or doctor trained or experienced in this type of cell therapy must be in place for at least 12 months preceding accreditation. So now that we're to Fatu order, the discussion needs to be had about whether we come under Auckland's fact accreditation um, because we are no longer seen as silos of DHPs. And that's something that the doctors are meeting nationally to discuss. They have meetings in Wellington where they talk about these sorts of things and how it might look in the future. And I think they're doing that reasonably regularly, maybe every three months at the moment. This is um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in the States. And coming to look at what it might look like from their point of view and what their criteria are to have these transplants. The HITH in red stands for um, hospital in the home, which we've um, been using recently with COVID, where people, people are recovering from COVID at home because they're deemed to be safe there. Um, so to be eligible for consideration of hospital in the home, care, patients must be undergoing the auto following malphalan conditioning, so that's specific to that centre. They must be able to give informed consent and be over the age of 18 years, must be medically stable, have available appropriate care or supervision, and have a suitable home environment, be able to use their own toilet and administer their own oral medication, which is 
what I mentioned earlier, they must also have access to a home telephone and available transport and be compliant. And what Sloan Kettering also go on to say is that you must live no more than 45 minutes by road from the hospital um, and you must be able to come in at least once a day. So what we were doing in London is that patients would come to us, <coughs> those that were living beyond say this 45 minutes, although I think it was less in London because of traffic so it might have been 30 minutes, they were housed in a hotel across the road from the hospital there was a, an alarm system set up if they got unwell in that hotel room and needed to come into the hospital. But generally, they came across, mobilised themselves across the road each day at an appointed time of, say, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. We would take their bloods, we would do their observations, temperature, blood pressure, pulse. We might weigh them if we were worried about how much they were eating and drinking. Um, check and review liver function, kidney function, also their bone marrow, if they needed any blood product support, we would give that to them. Um, what we are um, querying here is whether we would need to do a 30 minute system and what that's what we would be comfortable with. Was well, that still Zealand. cost effective in London, that system of people? Oh, that's another good question. I can only assume so. I mean, I think you're looking at a couple of thousand dollars um, for a hospital bed a night. So a hotel, even in the middle of London, there was probably some sort of a, an agreement made with that hotel, um, and it probably still would have worked out to be cost effective here. Yeah. Yeah. This is a table that I'm not, it, it's not completed, and I'm sorry for that, but it's been quite hard to get specific details from centres. Um, Vancouver General were really good. They do approximately 80 autos a year, which worked out to be about 1.5 a week. They had two consultants dedicated, so this is a staffing model, um, and uh, four junior doctors, 10 nurses, two pharmacists, and allied health. And allied health can be dietitian, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, and social worker. John Hopkins were able to give me staffing to some degree, but not the numbers that they did. And this asterisk means that they actually had nurse practitioners um, and not um, junior doctors. So they worked with two consultants. This is my little plug during conference to try and get myself a promotion, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but also promoting nursing as a whole because we want to try and attract nurses back from overseas. And if we have these slightly more complex um, positions where... Um, they're able to provide more autonomous care and follow on from the amazing things they've been learning overseas and that could mm. be quite attractive. Mm. And also the junior nurses coming up. Anyway, mm. um, they just didn't tell me how many they had in their outpatient setting to help cover this and this is predominantly, this is only an outpatient setting. Two pharmacists and again three allied health. Wellington Hospital, um, I guesstimated that they might do 10 a year um, because they were doing 16. Consultants, I didn't have that information, but I know that they have maybe five or six consultants there and they will allocate a consultant, um, I think it's each week, to the um, transplant setting. Um, some consultants like to follow their patients through from transplant, so um, it might be Palmerston North had no necessarily dedicated doctor, um, but they follow each of their patients through the transplant personally. And again, I didn't have numbers beyond that other than my assumption that they would have two pharmacists and three allied health. Wellington I thought probably had more because they were a bit bigger. Mm. But it gives you an idea we're a little bit scant on information um, but also we're a little bit scant on the actual staff to do these things. Mm. So um, for example m my job there are currently three of us that cover it part-time but we've had no increase in our hours for eight years to accommodate the increase mm. in patient numbers, which is makes it very hard. We we would need extra resource for providing this service. And I feel it's a great opportunity for me and one of my other colleagues who both got transplant experience mm. um, for us to help lighten the load at Auckland by having these patients. We can support the junior doctors that may not know about these um, specific cell therapies and also we can have um, a better experience for the patients mm -hmm. and 
I think you do an awesome job because it's, it's like being on the outside of, and going into the system. It's the first sort of friendly face, just so that I can contact and it's a gateway to the answers that I needed to find, whereas I, I don't seem to have access to the doctors as well. So yeah. that, that, that service that you provide and you share with that cell phone, that's just, it's, it's really, it, that, that does make a big difference. Yeah, lots of people say that. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Um, this is really wordy, and I just wanted to say that there are alternatives for how we store the stem cells. We do, they don't have to be frozen, and that just means that there's less side effect because the preservative that the stem cells get frozen with can cause you to feel a bit ill, um, and that's that sweet corn smell. So the alternative is to actually keep them in a specific fridge um, that can be stored at 4 degrees, and they're found to be just as active, the stem cells, and useful. Um, if they're not stored for more than six days. So this is a study looking at that. Mm. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about before I talked about um, a summary whoops, is... No, oh, just back to that previous one, that sounded quite interesting. Do you get a choice if, if you're doing the, um, the... at the moment? At the moment, no. Oh. So that no. uh, you, they freeze it and you have to have the corn syrup. That's my understanding, yeah. yeah. Um, NZ blood would have a better idea. And is it possi possible to do both? Like, would, if, it, if it was allowed, say, maybe okay, it's not. But if it was allowed, could you, when you start your, doing your um, harvesting, could you freeze those? And then you go, oh, actually, we're getting pretty good numbers here. Let's put those in the fridge. Can they, can they work that way? Uh, no, because it's a little bit more, um, you have to be a bit more scheduled with the space to have the transplant. So we can't say, Ken's harvested really well, let's just produce a transplant process for him. It has to be a bit more planned. So currently, because we have pressures on our inpatient beds, we freeze them, which I imagine is the reason why we freeze them and don't use fresh. Um, so that we can then schedule you a bed, which might not be for another two months, mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes longer, hopefully less, but, mm -hmm. um, and then we can thaw them when it's appropriate and you have the bed and you've had the chemo and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, in the hospital setting, things can happen, can't they? Yeah. So yeah. Mine was d delayed for a few months. Yeah, so it's unfortunate, but these are the things that we need to consider because of course harvesting, is, is, you know, it's quite invasive. There's lots of build up to it, making sure that we've got you in the best possible position to have it, that your body produces enough of the stem cells for the harvest. So yeah, there's a little bit more to it than that, but. Is it anything about, I mean, you know, more fitness, health, you know, and all that sort of stuff, is it, the better you are, the better it's gonna go? They, they like it because there are generally better outcomes if you are as fit as you can be. So as I've said, getting yourself to the toilet on the back. Cardiac health is good, lung health is good. Um, appetite, eating, um, mental health, and so I don't know what you talked about. bone marrow function, yeah. All of those need to be at a certain level because we know you have a better outcome. The more you're sitting in bed, the more you're sitting still, the more you're sitting down, the less likely you are to use your lungs properly, the more chance you've got for the secretions in the lungs to create infection. Those sort of things get considered. Yeah. I went in quite fit. I was gymming right up to the Friday before I was admitted <coughs> on, say, the Monday. But afterwards, my legs you know, were really quite weak. It took me a while to come back. Yeah. And then the appetite and drinking and sure and... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's after being in bed feeling so fatigued and ill for, for a period of... Well, I was pretty... I was, you, can you remember how I was? Oh, my was sick. <laughs> <laughs> you were sick, you were an infant. Oh, in the hospital, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and it doesn't take long, like a matter of days, for the muscle mass to start to decrease mm. when we're inactive. Yeah, well, that's very good. Yeah. The older you are, the worse it is. Yeah, yeah. that's why we encourage mm. bed exercises getting up to some degree to do stuff, basic stuff around the room while you're in. But that's also why being at home where you feel more comfortable to do those things, you're often more motivated to do those things, is potentially a better environment for you to be in to not assume the patient role, which we do in hospital because 
that's where we are, that's why we're there, we're a patient. At home, you kind of feel more like you can help yourself a bit, um, is how I would um, imagine it would be. What I want to know is, how does it actually work? Because, um, you know, if you get like an infection, how are you going to know you've got it? I mean, is somebody coming in every day and checking on you? So you'll be taking your own temperature, other than when you come into the day stay centre, to have it Which the is, taken then. And how often would that be? So once a day? Oh, yeah. once a day? Yeah. Sometimes what we did in London is we would have patients come back again at like 3 o'clock. Um, especially if we thought they weren't, say, incrementing. So um, if we had to give them platelets um, mm. because maybe they'd had a nosebleed, we wanted to check that the platelet level had maintained um, because they'd had a bleed. So we would bring them back in the afternoon at like 3 o'clock and take another full blood count to check the platelet mm. levels. So they'd go home? Or to the hotel. So these, oh, it, it was yeah. up to them, yeah, mm. if they were at home or in the hotel. It's not that easy to travel around London every year if you didn't have a car every day. Mm. If you do have a car. Yes. Mm. So you would go to hospital every day and they would do everything like take your weight because I mean, yep. you know, I guess one of the good things about being at home is that you don't get woken up all the time, which is what happened in the hospital. Yep. But you had your weight, you got woken up to have your weight taken. They found out you've got an infection. Yep. You have to have blood, um, fluids because you're not drinking, yep. etc. Threatening you if you don't drink your milk, whatever it is, stuff. Insures, yeah. Oh. Threatening you. Forty syrups. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um, this is where, and I, I, there was a slide that I've added since I'd sent this presentation through, so I'm sorry, but there was, I'll go um, to the next one and I'll talk a little bit more. My ideal is what I talked about on this slide. And I talked about um, pay, uh, like social workers that could go out and assess people's homes prior mm. to a transplant, mm -hmm. check to see if they were warm enough and dry enough, and they, if they weren't, getting them into a better position where they were. So insulation, heat pumps, those sorts of things, which would hopefully reduce patients' um, risk for infection and also open up this auto at home option to more people um, and then the other thing is providing a package that wraps around the patient while they're at home and whether that's um, you can now get devices that take your temperature and you wear them like a watch and they will take your temperature 24 7 which means that it would alarm when you maybe had a fever that you didn't know you had, which in reality in the transplant setting is ideal because it means we can get patients on to maybe even oral antibiotics sooner rather than them having to possibly come in because they've had the infection for two, three hours and not known before they check their temperature because they started to feel ill. So, I mean, this would be amazing because it would mean hopefully we could keep people at home more, which might be why those bigger studies that have this rate of 30% admission, it might be because they're using these technologies already. Mm. Yep. Um, and the other thing is dietitian, social work input, as I've already said. Physio, so like a personal trainer type um, program where patients at home are encouraged to do exercises each day in the hope that we're keeping them physically fit and the dietitian maybe is able to call them to ask what their weight's doing, or they're able to come and see them in the day stay um, while they're there. Obviously that might be a little bit trickier on Saturdays and Sundays. I was just wondering, the input internationally provides a kind of safety net, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Much like how COVID did. We saw how lots of other places in the world dealt with it, and then we were able to make some decisions. Informed us it more, better informed. Yeah. Yeah, so although it's frustrating sometimes to feel like we're behind um, the rest of the world with some of these things, it's also been a safety net, uh, which means that we can draw on the mistakes and the good things that were made in the hope that we can provide a really good service. From an ideal perspective, I know this is a new topic for you all, but what would you imagine would be really helpful for being at home during this process? You'd have your seat up at home would be okay, wouldn't it? I'd be fine. Mm. Yep. So obviously because cares. I don't have children living at home anymore. Yep. Kids and dogs. No. Nope. Animals. No, no animals. 
just my husband. <laughs> they told you that quarantine would be challenging at home. That would be the hardest thing, I'd say. Yep. Is it too much, um, too much variable, so. I just wonder about the stress on the person who mm. is the carer. Mm -hmm. the carer. Yeah. Because you're going, that person is going to be concerned that they don't pick up on something yeah. that happens yeah. quickly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And with myeloma, the treatment that we give in the lead up to these uh, stem cell transplants is generally quite well tolerated. So we don't see a huge number of infections like we might do with some of the more intensive treatments for lymphoma and, and leukemia. So it is a concern when you've not been through what that process looks like or how you might feel and, and um, yeah, I can understand that that would be a big... Um, and I could concern. see the cost for some families being prohibitive because somebody has to be at home with you for those four weeks or whatever yeah. that yeah. if you're still working or your partner's still working um, that's four weeks holiday or whatever take and off. I think that's with a social worker and some program of um, remuneration or, or something would have to come into play kind of like we have done with the COVID week of leave that's been added to your sickness leave at work something along those lines would need to be brought in um, for the, and we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of patients a year mm. you know our numbers are still quite small because you have to be eligible for the outpatient service so um, it's only going to be half of that say 206 total that we had um, at the start. Mm. So it's not, I personally don't think it should be out of the realms of possibility for Te Whatu Ora, you know, um, my goodness imagine the cost savings, this mm. is a small okay. a drop in the ocean, uh, presumably, I don't know if there's any super duper executives. Like to go through farm, <laughs> this process, I mean, because is there equipment involved? That's a really good question. Because, you know, if I yeah. Should we not get into farming? <laughs> How equipment? much longer have we got? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a huge thing. I don't know that they would. The, I mean, the I people with the knowledge yeah. to assess yeah. equipment, they haven't. No, that's right. And they're not allowing some stuff in. They're not allowing the hospitals to to advise them. Mm. So it's a, it's a really yeah. difficult, yeah. difficult the only double edged sword. Yeah. The only one I can think of is the thermometer that you wear 24 7 mm. um, I don't know whether that has to go through then yeah that's an interesting question yeah something well, we can bring up have to be paid for by somebody yeah it's very expensive a thermometer very yeah expensive. Ali, I'm not sure um, mm. I didn't look at the cost when I was looking at it mm. I was just a profile that is actually about the same price or less even than that. Because some of these thermometers are quite expensive. It's just like, yeah, those start watches, isn't it? Yeah. There's not much difference to that technology. Yeah, very similar because now diabetics can wear a glucose mm. monitor. Oh, don't get me on to that. Mm. <laughs> and the cost of that and oh. the lack of funding. Oh, okay. <laughs> in, terms, in terms of medication, like IV and oral, yep. um, that's specialist care, really. IV care? Yeah. 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 You have to go into hospital. Or so, you know, no. IV, you'd need to come into the hospital for anything. Yeah. So, mm. when we were in the hospital, she was on a line all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the specialist care that's, that was involved mm -hmm. in that process was um, specialist. Yeah, it couldn't be done at home. Yeah. 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 And she needed that. Well, the monitoring, I was in another world, but the monitoring every, you know, few. So for my blood huge. levels, yeah. yeah. So you, in your case, you probably would have been admitted by the sounds of what you went through. Mm. Yeah. So you may have started off as an outpatient and then come in. Yeah. I just was able to, what is it, manufacture enough stem cells. I didn't know that at the time. I was barely met, met the threshold. When and you collected? Yeah. You and then they tried again last, I, I don't know, before COVID and couldn't, couldn't do it. We failed. Yeah. But post, um, we, we've had an outpatient who got post out, who um, got double oh. the stem cells mm -hmm. and had them frozen yeah. And yeah. In, for in the case of future need. Oh, yeah. 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 It's Which when you're told to ask 
for them to do if they could. Yeah. They could. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's hard to know who's going to do well. Sometimes we get an inkling if the bone marrow is quite sensitive to the chemo. Um, and again, we don't know who that's going to be until we start the chemo process. Um, yeah. Stem cells are um, sometimes a bit of a mystery. We didn't know that at the time, and I think we could have. Oh, I couldn't. I didn't harvest. I barely harvested. No, this is the first time. Mm. The first time that we were going to have a be in need of a second transplant, plus um, to ask for that you know, that extra dose. So is that likely that if, if it permission you get a second or third, you have to go for a stem cell again? Some it's, do. It's yeah, it's not very it? common. Yeah, it's not, not common. very common to have a second. No, second or two. Yeah. Mm. Do you have to be a certain age to have it? Seventy. You would still need to be within the threshold so to be so fit yeah. enough. Yeah. So for a second transplant. You mean if you if you've, they've already taken the you know what the stem it? cells? They've already taken them, but you still have to be like under seventy to actually have them put back in. Yeah. Yes, and the, that's the, what my doctor said too. Yeah, mm. the criteria for having mm. two is if they think there's going to be a really high chance of relapsing in a short period from the first mm. one. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes they will give you one and then two prior to the relapse, but knowing that there's going to be a high likelihood that that, that relapse will happen. Yeah, again under the age of seven. Well, and also just to prevent the relapse. Yeah, I can't have it done. Well, the 70 is because of the body, is it? The, the, age, the yeah. aging process, the yeah. how the body the, responds. The chemo, all those toxicities that we talked about, you know, nausea and vomiting, puts strain on the heart, and if the heart's not good, then, you know, that's not good. There's a reason, yeah. Yeah, and um, if your lung function isn't good, you're more likely to get lung infections, and, and so that's right. something that we need to make sure is, is good before we start. We meet the criteria for a second, Though we couldn't harvest, mm. so yep. even though she had the assistance, you know, the shots, we uh, failed. Those injections are, oh, well, this is beside the point, but those injections are expensive, aren't they? Yeah, and they can have side effects, so bone pain. And, okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think if they feel that having a second harvest is good, or a, they will do it if there's adequate cells. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But not everyone who has the second harvest gets that second transplant because they may not need it. Thank you. That's okay. Was there anything else before I summarise and finish? Well I'm grateful for the stem cell I had. It's a transplant. Autologous. Yeah. 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 yeah but it's quite a process yeah. and I was always amazed at the science of this Ooh. little cell that gets taken out of its home environment, gets frozen, <laughs> it's put in this liquid that's obviously it can survive in but is for all senses foreign. Mm -hmm. Thawed out the brain. That, see, let's try that. Yeah, put it into a vein, which is not even where it's supposed to be. When it finds its way to the bone marrow, mm -hmm. it populates. So that's what sparked my interest 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, in summary, um, benefits to the patient's experience in hospital services hopefully would be um, a good outcome of this service. Extended services provided to patients in their whānau, so. Um, hopefully it means that more patients would be able to access it if we were able to set up their home environments better and proven to be either equal or better from a safety perspective and patient satisfaction. Uh, there would need to be business models to be um, able to provide funding for additional staffing in some centres and equipment. Yeah, that's it. There's references because that's what we do. <laughs> <It's really interesting. laughs>